Joining us now on our Book Talk segment, great to welcome Andrew. Really an interesting book, a uh, historical book. Anybody who grew up in New York, you're going to be interested, but you don't have to have been. It's called The Tong Wars. It's the untold story of vice, money, and murder in New York's uh, Chinatown. Really interesting uh, uh, story about what happened back around uh, the turn of the century. Uh, I'm talking about the 1900s, and uh, Scott Seligman joined us uh, by telephone today. And uh, Scott, good to talk with you. How are you? I'm Doug. Well, I to be here, Doug. Doing fine. Yeah, I had a chance to, to read through the book. I, I said before we went on, I grew up in New York, and you know, you, 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 I never went to I went to Chinatown once. I didn't really go there a lot, but you heard a lot of stories about mm -hmm. uh, the history of uh, that particular part of New York, and I didn't realize that uh, until I read your book. Uh, really, the the violence of uh, around the nineteen early nineteen hundreds. Mm -hmm. What happened? A really interesting story. Yeah, you read about the Italian gangs and the Jewish gangs and the Irish gangs, but nobody writes about the Chinese gangs. So I thought that was a pretty good opportunity for me. Yeah, I'd heard about Tammany uh, Hall and uh, you know the corruption of, uh, of New York City. I guess everybody kind of knew about right. that, but but this is really kind of intertwined, like you said, with Chinese gang. Right, and the Tammany Hall really provided the very fertile environment for all of this stuff to happen um, because it was so corrupt and it was so corruptible. The, the, the Halls got started actually because of gambling, and uh, you know the Chinese in America didn't have very many um, diversions. They were mostly male because most of the women stayed behind in China. And they would work hard six days a week. They were launderers or they were restaurant workers or something like that. And um, one of the things they liked to do was gamble. They also liked to visit prostitutes and smoke opium, but gambling was <laughs> a, the principal diversion. And gambling was, of course, illegal, and the police would shut it down when they saw it. So uh, one very enterprising Chinese man uh, came up with the idea that if he could pull all the gambling bosses together and tax them, he could use some of the money to pay off the police and, and the aldermen not to molest them and allow the Chinese to gamble in peace. And this was a, a, not only a brilliant strategy, it was very lucrative. And in fact, it was so lucrative that um, somebody else decided they wanted in on the business. So that's when you had the beginning of the two tongs fighting each other. Initially, it was all about control of gambling and vice in the Chinese quarter. I guess one of them was, uh, if I pronounce it, On Leongs and Hip Sings, right? Those the On Leongs. Rival mm -hmm. groups. Yeah. That's right. And uh, similar to... Uh, the On Leongs uh, were, were New York. The, the On Leongs were homegrown in New York. They started out there. The Hip Sings came in from California, um, and they're the ones that wanted them the piece of the pie. So that's really when the violence started about the turn, almost exactly the turn of the century, 1899, 1900. It's almost like, uh, like you said, with the, you know, the, the, uh, the gangsters that put Vegas together, the different uh, factions around the country, right. same, same kind of thing here, right? California, New York. Yes. And I think one of the reasons you haven't heard about it is that it was almost exclusively Chinese on Chinese violence. Um, they didn't have anything to do with the other gangs. Uh, this was really internal Chinatown stuff. The only, um, the only non-Chinese who were murdered in the, uh, in the wars were the people who were bystanders who managed to get in the way of a bullet here or there. Um, so it was, uh, it, was, it was all about Chinatown, and people kind of put Chinatown in a, in a, in a separate category and didn't pay much attention to it. And you said the Chinese that came to uh, to uh, Lower Manhattan, that's pretty much where Chinatown is. Uh, laundry, that's kind of what everybody kind of you know, associates with right. uh, those early businesses. I, I guess before that, didn't a lot of the Chinese come over here to help build the railroads in the U.S.? Is that why they were here originally? Uh, or? Actually, yes, actually it was even earlier than that. They first came over for the gold rush. Mm -hmm. The first wave was 18, 1849, 1848, 1849. And um, then when the Transcontinental Railroad was being built, a lot of Chinese workers worked on that. And it was when it was finished that the Chinatowns of the East Coast got, got established. After the China, there was no more work for a lot of these Chinese on the West Coast, and uh, they were competing with uh, whites for low-paying jobs, and there was violence against them. A lot of them decided to come East. So New York Chinatown's history basically goes back to the 1870s. And the same, you could say the same of Boston and Philadelphia and Washington, Baltimore, Chinatowns. It's all about the same thing. Um, so it was initially settled by Chinese, originally from South China, by way of the West Coast, they came to New York. And, um, that's, and, and the other interesting thing is that they established Chinatown precisely where it is located today. Mm -hmm. In fact, as I was doing the research for the book, I was studying these old pictures of Chinatown taken in like 1900 and realizing that the buildings almost exactly, or almost, almost all of the buildings still stand. 
They're the same places that these people lived and died, not, not new buildings built on the old site. That's what I kind of thought. I hadn't been there in, in a while. Last time in New York, I yeah. guess maybe in the early 90s. But, but those buildings, like you said, and you look at the pictures, didn't look like much change. Right. <laughs> That's right. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. How, how did you get in? I know you've, you've lived over in the, in the Far East, right? So is that kind of how you got interested yeah. in this particular story? or? Yeah, I mean, this one actually married a lot of my interests. Um, on the one hand, I've spent a lot of time in Asia and China. I've spent altogether about eight years in China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and I can speak the language. Um, but also, I was an American history major in college, and um, this was a really great opportunity to kind of blend it all together and look at what the, what the early Chinese here were doing. Nobody had paid much attention to it before. Um, and I wrote a couple of other books earlier about a couple of biographies of early Chinese Americans, people you might call heroes. And so this was an opportunity to expand my knowledge and look at some people who weren't so savory and try to figure out who they were, what they were all about. Don't want to give too much away. I want the folks to, to read the book, but uh, but Teddy Roosevelt plays a part in the story, right? He was a police commissioner he for does. a while and uh, and cleaning up That's Tammany right. Halls, and there was a lot that went on in New York politically as well. That's true, and I found some information that one of the Tongs actually approached Teddy Roosevelt to try to get him to shut the other guys down. <laughs> um, unfortunately, they made the mistake of threatening him, and you didn't threaten Teddy Roosevelt. No, no. <laughs> so he he pretty much sent them packing, and that was the end of that. I always thought it was interesting, Teddy uh, Roosevelt, who obviously you know became president, probably the only president that ever fought in the war himself on horseback, right? I mean, he... That's right. As, yeah, as the Rough Riders. Really I mean, he, I mean, he, he wasn't he, afraid to get in there himself. Real, <laughs> he was a real piece of work. That's yeah. right. Um, they hired him, actually. He had been the, to the head of the um, Civil Service Commission here in Washington. And they hired him because they wanted, one of the reasons they hired him is they wanted to clean up the police force in New York. It was terribly corrupt. And, and, and it was the system that made it that way. Uh, police, uh, in order to get a job as a cop or in order to get promoted to captain or to, uh, to, to another level up, you basically had to pay off the Tammany Hall bosses. Right. And it was way more money than you'd ever make in a year. So they would, they would borrow, they, uh, borrow money, and in order to repay the debts, they would essentially tax the people that they policed. If you didn't give a contribution, you got shut down. So it was a horrible, corrupt system that really just cried out for reform. And Roosevelt was one of the first ones that really tried to um, put in some discipline in the police department, promote people for the right reasons instead of the wrong reasons. But they made so, such little money, even compared to uh, you know, right. the time, that uh, they almost had to right. get the bribe money to survive, right? Well, that's right. In fact, I found an example of one captain who was in charge of the 6th Precinct, which was in charge of Chinatown. And um, he made like $1,100 a year. Yeah. And then I found his obituary several years later and he had left an estate of over a hundred thousand dollars and you kind of wonder where he got it <laughs> well it's a fascinating uh, book again called tong wars the untold story of vice money and the murder in new york's chinatown and uh, uh Scott, so let me give out a website you can get more information on the book sure uh, it's www.tongwars.com t-o-n-g-w-a-r-s.com now i'll get you there Great. I'm, I'm sure there's a, there's a movie to be made about this. I, I hope that works out for you, too. <laughs> we sure hope so, Doug. Thank you. Scott, good talking to you. Thanks for being with us. I'm Stan Brock. Thirty years ago, I formed Remote Area Medical to help people overseas. But then we found generations of families in America isolated by poverty from the health care they need. Together, we can take dental, vision, and medical help to a million adults and their kids right here at home in the United States of America. If you'd like to order the book we're talking about, Please go to DougMilesMedia.com and enter the author's name in the Amazon search box. Thank you for listening. Please come back soon for more conversations here at DougMilesMedia.com. This has been a presentation of Doug Miles Media, all rights reserved. You can listen to or download previous programs at iTunes, Stitcher.com, or DougMilesMedia.com.